Hey there everybody, it's Nathan Cool with NathanCoolPhoto.com and today I wanted to talk about the results of my latest survey which shows kind of the pulse of what's going on with the real estate photography industry. So this is uh, August 2018 and so if you're seeing this video and it's 2020 or 2019 you might want to take a look at some updated uh, survey results. But anyways, this is the most recent results that came in. What I did was I pulled some people off of my YouTube channel, also off my Facebook page and then I've got a big enough sampling, I've got some notes here that I'll read off and I'll show you these results. But first, just a little bit about what's going on with this survey and what it means. So there was basically 10 questions that I asked and I'm gonna go through those and show you the results. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about what those results possibly mean. But first, a little bit about the survey itself. So I got about 150 uh, respondents on this. So about 150 people went ahead and filled out this survey. Now, that's kind of a small sampling compared to I've got about 14,000 followers right now on YouTube and I've got about 5,000 on Facebook and not everybody likes to take a poll but with 150 people and photographers most around the United States a few that were international but with that then we have just enough of a sampling to avoid what's known as regression of the mean and also the uh, law of large numbers both of which basically say that if you have a lot of results things are just going to kind of go toward the middle and show an average. So with this, for instance, I did a small test. One is that I took these results also on one of them, on the question when we get to drones, and I did that by itself, just in the community on Facebook, uh, excuse me, on YouTube. And so I was able to get some results, and I'll talk about that when I get there. And there were some differences in there, but we're still pretty much on track. Also, the answers that I got were very similar to what I've seen in my uh, neck of the woods out here in Southern California. And of course, that would just be completely anecdotal, not statistical, if I were to say, well, based on what I see around here, this is what the state of things are. So with these statistics, we're able to dive into it a little bit more. So you ready to get started? Let's take a look at these results. So the first question that I asked was, how long have you been shooting real estate? As we can see here, there was the bulk of the respondents, it was over 50% were just between one and five years, and there were quite a few then, about a third were shooting less than one year. So what does that mean? Well, it could be also that the people that are on, for instance, Facebook that are following me, people that are following me on YouTube, we might have a lot more people that are getting into the industry, so they haven't been shooting quite as long. But we can still see that there's a lot of people, when we're talking uh, 51%, that are still one to five years into this, and then it starts to wane off. Now, some of that could be if somebody's been shooting real estate for more than 10 years. In today's day and age of technology, they might not be on YouTube watching any of this, or follow me on Facebook also. It also could mean that there's a little bit of burnout in this industry, and that's something that I've seen, but I can assure you too that there's guys in the industry, old guys with gray hair, bald head, whatever, like myself, that have done this a very long time and continue to do it. So the most likely scenario out of this is that people do stick with it, but there's a weeding out process that happens. So there is known to be kind of a high attrition rate in real estate photography, and so that's something to just bear in mind stick with it, it does pay off. It's something I talk a lot about in my uh, fourth book, the one on business techniques for real estate photography, is that you do have to stick with this. And it could be hard, very hard the first year or two. But once you start getting your feet, you start getting the right type of clients, then things can go along better. So let's move along though to the second question that I asked in this survey. What format camera are you using? Now, this was a, a very interesting uh, result in that most people were using full frame cameras. I, for one, do that. It's what I also recommend. Two thirds of everybody uh, surveyed that responded are we using full frame cameras. Now, when we look at the last results of, you know, there was one third of the people that were doing this for less than one year, it does show, though, that the people that are getting into this are doing probably something else besides just real estate photography. And that's one of the reasons that I mentioned uh, in other videos and my books, for instance, is that when you're selecting your gear, a uh, full frame camera will let you do a lot more. So you could get into weddings, you can get into portraits, you can start doing commercial work. A lot 
lot of other stuff. So when you think that, oh, I'll get into real estate photography, I'll just get a crop sensor camera, you can get away with that. But if you really wanna do other work to do your entire totality of photography work and also things you might wanna do on the side, then full frame camera, once again, is my recommendation. And from these results, we see that two thirds of the respondents were also using full frame cameras. Third question, let's move on to that. This was a very controversial one concerning drones. So in this survey, interesting results, the, there was about one third of the people surveyed, of the photographers here, that uh, they were actually certified and insured. And then about 10% of those people said that they weren't even certified or insured and that another third just didn't do it at all. And then almost another third, it was about 20%, decided to use elevated uh, pole or a tripod. So this was a very interesting result. And as I mentioned just a little bit ago, this was one question that I posed on just the, my community on YouTube to get the results. And in that survey, with, with about 14,000 followers, just strictly that, uh, there was about uh, close to uh, almost 100 uh, respondents on that. And that turned out to be almost one third of everybody said that they didn't have any certification, but they were still doing drones. Now, one of the things that I did, it was a little bit of a trick, if anybody fell for this survey, was that I said in that wording for that second response of if you're doing it without a certification, are you rogue? So it's a little bit of a, somewhat of a, a funny thing to kind of say. It's also something that can change and it frames your content on and your frame of mind on what you might respond to. So take that with a grain of salt. But anyways, either way, it was about 10 to 30% of respondents said that they did drones without a certification. FAA isn't really doling out fines, we know that. They're sending out warnings at best. There's always a chance you could take to do this. We've seen some problems in, in our area uh, with guys that have gone rogue and are doing this without certification or liability insurance. One uh, realtor recently just had her car hit with a drone. I've had clients tell me that uh, horror stories of having to pull stuff off because they were shooting near a Navy base, didn't realize it, and now the drone pilot got his warnings to never do that again but they had to pull everything off and didn't get their money back from that real estate photographer. So what I do, and as you may know, and I've talked about it throughout the books, I don't do drones directly right now, maybe one day, but I do the elevated uh, shots using that Manfrotto 24 footer. There's videos on that as well on my channel. And uh, that gets me quite a bit of what I need. And then I farm out my, the rest of the drone work to go really high to a drone partner who's certified, he's insured, he's top notch, he does nothing but drone work. So anyways, one of my recommendations, but this was interesting on what's actually going on with the industry. There also is when you talk about just one third of people that are certified and insured, that kind of reflects on if we're actually getting enough drone work to make this actually worthwhile. So when I quote drone prices for the full on drone, because of what it costs, it's a kind of a turnoff. So when people are saying, oh, you know, I could throw that in as just an extra free shot for you, or maybe uh, 25, 50 bucks. Well, <laughs> if you're doing that, you one, I don't know how you're gonna pay for your drone equipment, your insurance, your certifications and all that. So chances are, when I've seen people do that, I know some of the photogs, at least around this area, they're not certified and they probably don't have the insurance either. So anyways, very interesting thing. It reflects on our industry as well uh, that it's not 100% really qualified to do drones. A lot of people do in the aerials with just a pole or like the Manfrotto 24 footer. So bear that in mind when if you're thinking about approaching the FAA 107, it might not be the do all end all for what you actually need to do for your next step to be a differentiator. So moving on to the next question, this was an interesting one on how many images do you typically deliver? And you can see that there's that sweet spot right between 25, 35 photos. This is something I've talked about before when I did the analysis on uh, if photos actually have a quality uh, factor to them for how fast they sell a particular property and what value they get out of it. Uh, you can search through the YouTube channel here and, and you'll see that uh, particular one. It's uh, does photo, do photos matter? But it's interesting that we still keep it at that level. So some people are saying that, oh, I'm getting requests for 45, 50 pictures. I just can't keep up. Well, 
whoever's doing that, there's not a lot of it. If you have a lot in your area, they didn't actually uh, go on to the survey here. And I know that a lot of people on the survey, not just from the respondent on the first uh, question of one to five years was the most popular answer for experience, but also I know personally people who have contacted me and they said, thanks, I filled out that survey. And these are very experienced photographers. So yes, it's still about 25 to 35 is the bulk of the number of pictures. So the another uh, thing that was interesting, I get asked from time to time to do twilights. I don't know if you do too, but this was one question that has come up because it does take extra work. And I have some uh, clients they'll sometimes ask, hey, can you just throw that in? Just shoot me late in the day. But as we know, there's a lot of setup, a lot of other work. So it's usually a costly add on. Not as costly as some of the other things you might do, but still an add on. So the next question was, what percentage of your shots are twilights? And as we can see from these results, the bulk of people said that it was less than 10%. So having twilights does provide a very impactful picture. There's no doubt about it. But is it necessary to sell a home? So when a home buyer is looking online, they do want to see something quality. There's some psychology there behind that. They aren't necessarily seeking quality pictures. They aren't looking to edit pictures like we would, or for instance, that someone in marketing would see, oh, this is a more beautiful picture, but does it actually help sell? And so in this case, if we have less than 10% are actually twilights, that tells me that then about 90% of homes don't need them. And it may be that 100% of homes actually don't need it, but it is an add-on. One thing to bear in mind though is and I get this a lot, the seller actually requests a twilight shoot. So shooting isn't just for the MLS, it's not just for the realtor, it's also you're shooting someone's home that they designed, they, they, they decorated, they lived there, they had children there, they had family, love, laughed, everything in that home, and they're going to leave it and they want memories of it. And even if they aren't going to take those pictures with them, they don't want to be disgraced, you know, that their home wasn't worthy of the best possible photo. So just bear that in mind. And definitely, if you haven't done Twilight's good practice to do it, it will come up, even though it's not the most popular thing that seems to be out there. And I can attest to that too, that 10% or less of my shoots are actually Twilight. Next question was about Matterport. Now this used to be a very popular thing at one time, I think for about a month. And we can see right now what's happening with Matterport and that 82% uh, of all the respondents said they just don't do Matterport at all. The rest of them are just such small numbers, it doesn't matter. We can almost say that it's just dying on the vine. So agents out there, at least in, in our area, they were willing to give it a try. And so there were some people that invested in the Matterport and it's like, hey, this is great. And then different feedback came back. For instance, some people are like, well, the quality of that picture looks awful compared to the rest of the photography that you took of my house. Well, you can't edit the Matterport. You got to go through their software. Other people also felt that it was a little bit intrusive because the person coming in doing Matterport wasn't necessarily fiddling around staging each room, moving small little things or blurring out family pictures and things of the sort, so they felt that it was a little bit more invasive, but also is it really effective? So think about this, if you're having a hard time getting somebody to pay for a real drone photography to, to keep you licensed and certified and, and insured with enough liability and a really good quality drone, if they're balking at those prices that you're throwing out, they're probably not going to also want to pay for Matterport. The drone would probably have more bang for the buck uh, compared to Matterport. So basically, dying on the vine, Matterport, my opinion too, never got into it, never saw any real value in it. There's a lot of other alternatives you can do, especially with walkthrough videos, the slideshow video tours. Just a video or two ago, I also posted one on how to take your stills and put into a really nice video with music for a very impactful type of presentation. So for Matterport, I'll leave that up to you, but my opinion, thumbs down. Survey says also, eh, thumbs down. All right, so two more questions on here. One, how many shoots do you do throughout the year? So this was interesting in that we also have to bear in mind that there's a seasonality to this, but the bulk of the respondents said that they did actually less than 100. Now, some of that could also be because there were some new photographers coming into the industry. And like we saw in question one, 
there was quite a bit, one third of the respondents have been doing this less than a year. So that would make sense that that was the case. But if we look at the rest of those numbers though, we're looking at then when you total up everything else, the other 50% were doing more than 100 shoots a year. So it is seasonal and out here in Southern California, the bulk of the season tends to run about seven to eight months and we still get shoots throughout the winter because we really don't worry about snow, but fewer people are selling during that time of year, of course, just like about any place else. So it's uh, definitely something to bear in mind that if you're in a market that has, you've got snow, you're up north, you definitely have that seasonality, you can't be expecting to do 400 shoots a year. If you're in a very sunny location, you're in Southern California, Arizona, you're in Hawaii, something like that, yeah, if you're getting a few hundred shoots a year, that's pretty good, but it also depends on what you're charging for your shoot, how big of a house. Out here in Southern California, a lot of the shoots I get tend to be very large houses. So I might only have time to do one shoot a day, maybe only two shoots a day. If you're doing smaller places, condos, a thousand square foot homes, things like that, you know, if you're knocking in three to four uh, houses a day, you're gonna be out shooting me for the number of homes, although I might actually be pulling in more. So it really varies quite a bit, but something just to bear in mind, that the bulk of all the respondents were actually doing less than 100 a year. I know for a fact I do a lot more than that, but that's just something to bear in mind. Do you work alone or on a team? 90% said they're just lone wolves and they're working uh, just without a team. So this is something to consider when you're thinking about expanding. You're getting real busy. What do you do? Do you want to bring on another photographer? Well, most people don't. The reason being is it's very costly. So if you are running a successful real estate photography business, it also means you're very competitively priced. Once you start bringing in more people, you might have to start making cuts someplace else. You definitely have to become somewhat probably of a corp. You have to start doing W9s, W4s uh, for people. You have to be able to, to uh, or 1099s I should say, to farm some of this work out and contract. It brings in a whole other area of liability if you are actually working on a team. And so it makes sense that because of what the, the restrictions are for the monetary flow that comes out of real estate photography and the market demand for it, it, that most people just do this on their own. So in my book on business techniques for real estate photography, that's why I talk about first getting into being a sole proprietor and then looking at doing the S Corp later, which is made for people like us that are doing real estate photography and being self-employed, but getting a better tax break out of that. So two more questions here, one regarding the slideshow virtual tours like through Tour Buzz, how often do you provide them? Most people actually said, almost half of everybody said that they never do. Uh, as far as everything else, maybe about 20% or fewer. So it seems to be something else too that's not as popular. Now, this seems to be going out of favor as well, especially in my area. It's not as popular. Tour Buzz made this worse with the audio restrictions they haven't been able to overcome that were imposed by Chrome and Firefox and other uh, browsers that don't auto start the audio. So they made them, basically took the venom out of the snake on that. Plus technology has gone so far. It's easy enough to do walkthrough videos, uh, even though Matterport isn't really in favor. There's a lot of things still that you could do that look better and work better than trying to do something across mobile um, with a uh, with a virtual tour through Tour Buzz. And most don't want to pay for it either. It's just not that big of a deal um, compared to other things that they could do as an add-on. So there are people that always do it. And here there was 14% that did it on all their shoots. And I know photographers that still do that because that's kind of the old fashioned way of doing it. But if you break that out of your price and you can become a little bit more competitive. Quickly moving on to the last question then was how often do you shoot walkthrough videos? This was something that really hasn't become too popular, but it's starting to pick up some momentum. We can see that over half of the respondents here uh, never do any walkthrough videos, but there's about uh, a quarter to about half of the people do it either sometimes, usually, or rarely, um, but there's very few that, that do it always. So it is something that's gaining momentum and be interesting to see how this pans out over the coming months. And of course, I'll have more results, hopefully another survey in maybe about another six to nine months. 
So anyways, that's the results from this survey, August 2018, on kind of the state of where things are with the real estate photography market. Once again, it's a sampling of 150 photographers around the United States and a few that were international. So it's not everybody in the United States doing this, but it does give us a pretty good idea on what's going on in the market. Some of this also can be expanded on. Once again, I've mentioned it a few times through the video in my book on business techniques for real estate photography. I have a link in the description of this video where you can pick up a copy of that, and there's a lot of good tips in there that I provide on expanding your market, getting customers, and how to actually attack all this from the perspective of the long term. So be in it for the long game. Anyways, I hope this video and these results were useful for you and that you can use some of this in your real estate photography business as well. If you did like this video, you can subscribe to my YouTube channel. It won't cost you anything. And as soon as one of these videos is posted, you'll be the first to know. Thanks a lot for watching. Until next time, take care, be safe, and get out there and shoot something.